Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging series, um, a series where we explore the lived experiences of individuals from the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities. Um, it's a place where people share their sense of identity and their sense of belonging, a place where people are open about their journeys. It's a place where we can all belong. So I say this every week and I am so excited that we have a really special guest with us today. We've got Professor Omar K. Matar and Omar is a professor of fluid mechanics um, and he is the chair of um, multi-phase fluid dynamics at Imperial College London. Omar, it's a real privilege and pleasure to have you here with us. Um, I'm going to start off as I do with my usual first question, which is, can you tell me as you were growing up, what it was that gave you your sense of identity and sense of belonging? Thanks very much for having me here, uh, Wayne. I think it's, uh, it's a real honor for me to be uh, here on, on belonging. Um, and I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Um, uh, so the, the thing that I guess made me feel like I belong to something, I suppose, really for me was um, academics, right? So I, I, um, I guess from an early age, I recognized that I could, I could do, you know, I could do okay in this space. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whereas, you know, in terms of sports and music and, and, and arts and things like that, I was, I was okay. Uh, but I felt that, you know, this was really my space. And so I, I belong to uh, the, the type of folks that could do well in, in this uh, uh, area here. And so that gave me my initial uh, sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would have to say that there was much less of a, a, a sense of belonging to a country or a nation or a part of the world because I moved a bit around, you know, to, to start off with. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm originally from the Middle East, um, and, and I think, you know, when I first came into this world, there was, uh, there was some turbulence, <laughs> it's fair to say, in that uh, neck of the woods, and, and that turbulence somehow <laughs> continues to be there, yeah. uh, unfortunately. Uh, but that turbulence did lead me to move around a little bit, and so that belonging wasn't so much to a part of the world or a culture or whatever. It was really more uh, to do with with academia and academics. So, so, tell me about your clearly, as you just said, that you had um, well, when you were young, you were moving around um, with your parents. What is it that your parents did, and how did how did they support your your desire for academia or for education? So, um, my dad uh, was a journalist. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, you know, both my parents are Syrian, right? Yeah. Um, and at that point in time, my parents were working actually in Beirut in, in Lebanon. So I was I was born in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, and I was born maybe a few years before the civil war broke out in, in Lebanon. So I remember that very well, right? I remember the, uh, the sound of uh, gunfire, gunshots and, and things like that down the street. And so that was quite frightening. Yeah. So the idea was to move to the then uh, more stable uh, neighboring country, Syria, which was our country of origin. So we moved there. Uh, and then there was uh, some thinking that ultimately we might need to move to yet another uh, country in anticipation of maybe other things happening uh, in that region, yeah. um, you know, in the future. So we then moved to, to Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Um, and I started to go to school in, in Syria, actually, when, when we moved from Lebanon, um, you know, early on. The, the Syrian system uh, at that point in time was, was actually quite strict. Uh, and, they, and, and performance was measured through very regular examinations. So I remember taking exams when I was maybe five and a half, six years old. We would take exams, there'd be written exams, you know, people would look at our performance and things like that. And so, I, I mean, I look at that now and I think, I mean, I, I've got my own kids, I look at them and, and it's a completely different system. Yeah. And, and, the, and the measurement and the performance um, were very, very narrow in, in, in scope, right? Yeah. 
but nonetheless, I was doing well and I liked learning quite a lot. And so my parents saw that. Um, and, and I think maybe that motivated the move away uh, to, to, to Cyprus to try to maybe get me to learn additional languages. Because, you know, in, in, in Syria, I learned Arabic, obviously, that's the, the country, that's the primary language there. Uh, and then also, of course, uh, French, because we used to be a French protectorate uh, back in the day, gaining independence, I think, in 1946, well yeah. before my birthday, before you ask, Wayne. <laughs> 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 um, but but there, was, there was no English at that point in time, right? So I didn't know any English. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, why don't we hop over to Cyprus, we can start a new life, it could be potentially more stable, and you can learn languages and things like that. And so that was one way by which they supported me uh, to, uh, you know, advance uh, myself uh, in, in, in academics. The other thing is they had their eye ultimately on tertiary education, right? So they were thinking, okay, so Omar at some point is going to go through high school and at some point he has to go and more than likely study university, study abroad. Uh, and the question of being able to do that uh, in the UK at that point in time as a Syrian national uh, were, well, it was out of the question. Yeah. Um, and so the idea was to, to remain in Cyprus, adopt the culture there and become naturalized so that I can ultimately uh, come to the UK and, and study. And that's ultimately what happened. I came to Imperial uh, to study chemical engineering, actually in this department here, um, again, a number of years ago where I did my first degree. And, um, and that, you know, I've been at Imperial um, since when I first arrived in 1989, but there was a loan period where I went to America uh, to do a PhD and came right back to yeah. start my lectureship. But, but that initial uh, investment in me, I, I think was really quite critical without which I, I honestly, I can tell you, I don't think I'd be sitting here with you today. So all right, then, before we, we explore that, that those elements a little bit further, can you tell me a little bit then about what it was that attracted It sounds like your parents had a big vision for you. They, they, they could see your potential. They wanted to help you to fulfill that potential as all good parents do. Mm. Um, but why, why Imperial? What was it about Imperial? So it, it's a, an interesting question because um, I, I guess, you know, the, the, the first decision was where in the world, right? Um, and it, it was decided that it would be in the UK because there was a close affinity between Cyprus and the UK, lots of people from the UK in Cyprus uh, and, and, and the other way around. So culturally, it's very similar. Uh, and also in terms of universities, very strong universities. Um, and in, in particular, in terms of my chosen subject field, mm -hmm. uh, it was going to be engineering or it's going to be something technical, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so the, the first decision was the UK. The next decision was there are lots of really good universities and good fits. Uh, so which one? Um, and it so happened that the uh, uh, top student in my university, in my school at that point in time, was going to Imperial. She was going to do biochemistry uh, and she and I would talk semi-regularly. And so, so what are you going to do next year? Are you doing your A-levels? She's going, I'm going to Imperial College, she said. Um, and it wasn't called Imperial College London. It was just Imperial College. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's in London, she said. And, and I'm going to do biochemistry. And I think it's a great place. And, and you need to think about that, she said. Uh, and it's just those words, Imperial College, for whatever reason, Wayne, mm -hmm. they resonated. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I ended up applying to Imperial as my number one choice. And I didn't apply to any of the other uh, universities that you might be thinking about, Pro probably because... Um, I was thinking about chemical engineering in particular, and Imperial had a, a really strong program. Yeah, it was known to us at that point in time as well, in Kemenge. So I thought this is the place. Uh, I suppose the additional element to it was London. Mm -hmm. Very eager to come to London, see what London's like, the culture here and everything like that. It was massively different from uh, back home, certainly in terms of size and grandeur. I mean, well, yeah. uh, you know, my, my hometown at that point in time was a few tens of thousands and and here it was just vastly different. So I was very, I was very much looking forward to, to that experience. 
although you may have been looking forward to it, what about your parents? <laughs> what, what, what were their their thoughts? Their thoughts, I think they're obviously excited for me. And mm -hmm. in, in many ways, you're obviously very proud that I'm going to go to a really good place to study. Uh, but uh, there was some trepidation, right, that they were going to send their, their child um, you know, to, to the other side of the world, you know, from their perspective, it's too you know, far away. Yeah. What's how is he going to cope? How's he going to manage? The the added complications is also because I'm an only child. Yeah. And so there, <laughs> you know, if it goes wrong with him, we don't have any there's no plan B. There's no yeah. other one. There's there's nothing <laughs> we can do. <laughs> and so and so that's uh but but you know uh they recognized that it was fine the the other thing was they were encouraged by the fact that there were other people that they were sending they were sending their their kids over to the uk and actually imperial also to study and so there was some mutual reassurance that things are going to be fine don't worry about it so, and, so, so were they although you were coming over you weren't coming over alone there, there was a small support network. Did you have a support network which you could rely upon when you did arrive here in London? How did you find your feet here? Yeah, so there was no one that was traveling with me from like my friends and, and so on. However, there were there were people from Cyprus uh, that had um, you know moved over here. It's obviously a, a big network of, of, of folks. Uh, that were either connected with the university or not that we could tap into to ask basic questions. You know, where'd you go for food? Where'd you go for this and that and the other? Mm -hmm. That was okay. And also when I arrived here, there was a uh, like a Cypriot society uh, that you could chat to and, and talk to. And so they could give you some directions and, and pointers, which I think mm -hmm. is good. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, Wayne, that, um, you know, Arriving in the department here and then just finding the support network in the department. And, uh, you know, we had we had a, a system which I think exists today as well, which is the, the like a, a buddy scheme. So somebody from a higher year looking yeah. after you, answering your questions. There's a personal tutorial system. So that that worked pretty well in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think, you know, once past that first term, which was really a transitional term for me, I never looked back. It was completely fine. I'd seen everything once by then, yeah. and, and it was okay. You know, by then I'd been to lectures, I'd submitted coursework. There was even a, a Christmas test which we we took just to kind of get us in the mood as well. So, so that was all okay. I'd done my first bit of shopping by myself, and 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 you know the, the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds absurd now, but these were important issues, critical yeah. facts Absolutely. back in the day. Right. Absolutely. So you knew you could survive. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, I, I knew I could survive. Exactly. That's, that's, that's fantastic. So within, it sounds to me from what you were saying is that you had support mechanisms around you from the buddying system, yep. your tutorials with your um, supervisor or your personal tutor. All of those were helping to encourage you to fulfill your potential. Yeah. Yeah. So how did now that you felt comfortable did you get a sense thinking about the idea of the sense of belonging did you start to get a sense of belonging in this environment yes so and and the um and i got that sense uh and that, and that actually really kind of shocked me in a positive way at christmas mm -hmm. at the at the end of the autumn term of my first year here mm -hmm. when i went back and I find myself, you know, missing friends, missing Imperial, missing London. And I suddenly realized that there has been a, there's a transition. I was, I probably wasn't aware of it when I was going through it. Mm -hmm. Right. But at that, uh, during the break, I realized that actually I, my home now, right, is there. Yeah. I belong there. That's yeah. my future, you know, no longer here. Uh, and I think that happened reasonably quickly. Uh, and then I, I never really looked back. I mean, I, I became convinced that that was the thing to do is to to move uh, actually here, probably yeah. beyond beyond the course as well. So yeah. I started to think about that even beyond the MEng course. Fantastic. So you've got your MEng in chemical engineering. Yeah. So there's always that pivotal moment at, as you're coming towards the end of the course, whether to go and become a practitioner in the field as, you know, go and get a job, 
um, go back home. Um, what was what what helped you to make your decision as to what to do um, after your degree? Okay, so I I think I'd made the decision to become an academic at an early age, mm -hmm. right? So, and I, I must have been around maybe 11 or 12. I became very interested in academia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was reading widely and uh, there was one article that I'd read which really resonated with me, which was quoting a professor at university uh -huh. about some uh, issue. Uh -huh. and, um, and, and really what happened there was that I, I just thought, you know, it's great that there, there's so much respect, right? According to this person at university, that they're thinking of them as the reference for that area, right? And so, they, they, you know, this person must be very clever, very erudite, very widely read in order to have achieve that status. And that really appealed to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I quite liked, um, I quite liked that. So I thought that's what I'm going to do. So in fact, I, I never really applied for jobs in industry uh, at the, um, you know, as, as I was heading towards graduation, it was just grad schools. Right. And I wanted to go to the States because I wanted to experience America, mm -hmm. right? And I thought you could experience it by just going there on holiday, but that's not really experiencing the States. So you've got to, you've got to try and, and, and live there for quite some time and actually get something out of that experience. So I thought PhD, mm -hmm. right? So you went to America. I'm, I'm very interested in, because now this is country number four or country? Yeah, yeah I think so. Syria, Leb Lebanon, Syria, Cyprus, UK, and then the US. Yeah. All right. So, so we're on country number five. Right? Yeah. Um, how was that, that, that transition there from having been in the UK? Did you find it as a kind of like an alien thing or how was it for you? Okay, so um, what I did was in the third year of my degree course here, mm -hmm. in the summer of my third year, I went to the States for um, maybe eight weeks, and I spent them doing a research project mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, in the Gaithersburg, Maryland. There, there is a national institute there for standards and technology. So I, I spent that time doing a project, which actually then I brought back mm -hmm. uh, to Imperial and I used that to write an article, which then helped me to get into grad school. Right. But the fact that I'd spent about eight weeks there, I think was was really good because I sort of I'd broken the ice with America. I kind of, you know, immersed myself to a certain extent in the culture. I kind of understood a little bit about, you know, what the place was about and things. And that was on the East Coast. And I ended up going to grad school on the East Coast. So culturally, it, it was similar because, you know, America has actually quite a lot of diverse cultures uh, there. So I thought that that was uh, a good thing to have done. And that prepared me to a certain extent to go to the States at the end of my fourth and final year here at Imperial as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when I went there, though, there was still an adjustment. Though that adjustment, I think, was less about the culture mm -hmm. and more about the culture of the university that I went to, right? and the way that they did business there and the way that they ran the courses. And, and there are small differences, but they actually they ended up being quite big differences. Uh, and so there was a, a transitional period there, which lasted, I would say, for about, well, for a few months again. And then, you know, everything was fine after that. So it's interesting that you say that because that, that, that kind of like demystifying the rules or, or learning the, the, the rules of the game, as it were, because you've gone to a new institution yeah. um, and they do things slightly different. Mm. Was there, what was it that helped you to navigate that process, do you think? Was it just the familiarity of, or were there people who said, you know what, when we say office hours, it means that we're available, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. What was it? So again, it was connections, forging connections with people, right? Uh, and establishing those connections with people who are friendly and supportive and who could relate to you, could relate to your experience, who had been there before uh, and had experienced a little bit of uncertainty and doubt and, you know, slight anxiety about, you know, will I fit in? Will I succeed? Where do I do this and that and the other? Um, and, you know, there, there was support. Uh, and and the professors there were supportive as well. They obviously recognised that you know they're these are international students, 
okay, so they come from the UK, but there are certain nuances here which are important. Let's just uh, make sure that they feel at home. Mm -hmm. um, the department that I went to there was a relatively small department. So we're talking about 20 members of staff. I mean, here at Imperial, here in, in my department, we've got 40 plus academics. So twice as big. And so this department is actually much larger than the, uh, than the one that I went to. So the one that I went to had a family feel to it. <laughs> it was a bit like that, right? Uh, and the classes were small. So there was, you know, 10, 15 people as a, as a graduate class picked from all over the world. Right. So it was small. And so we established friendships quite quickly and everybody was anxious because there for the PhD, you know, you don't get to carry on before you pass. They're, they're, they've got these brutal qualifiers, uh, some of which have been abolished since. <laughs> they make you take these three, five and a half hour exams. You've got to take 12 courses for credit. You've got to they stop you halfway through your PhD. Then they've got, you've got to do a, a mini PhD or something completely different from your subject area. So there are lots of these hurdles that they put in your way. Ultimately, you know, that makes you stronger. Uh, but everyone had a bit of anxiety, no matter how good of a student you are. You're like, oh, can I <laughs> can I do this? Um, how, so, long so was, how long was the PhD then? Because typically here it's like three, three to four years. Yes. So with that PhD there, if they've got these interruptions and things. Yeah. So it it's the typical uh, PhD there is about five years. Right. It could be longer. So there were people that we would regularly encounter at coffee, in, you know, in the department who were there for their sixth year. They were starting to write up and, and things like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, in, in other departments, in, uh, there were a couple of people that we knew in computing, one of them was in the, in his uh, eighth year in, in English and the humanities. It would be longer because it takes time to write something, you know, like a like a book or a novel or, or, or whatever it was that that was that was their metric there. That took longer. So whereas, as you say, over here, it could be 36, could be 42 months and you're out. Yeah. Um, but but I would say uh, that I think I came back, uh, you know, feeling quite strong and feeling quite confident to start my academic career on the back of that level of training. So let me, I'm going to just, I want us to go a little bit technical. I'm, I'm warning everyone, we're going a little bit technical now. Tell us a little bit about what it is that you studied for your PhD and, and how that's been the launch pad for the rest of your career. So, okay, interesting story. Um, I went there with the intention of studying a particular topic, mm -hmm. right? Um, and th the way things work here is you identify a supervisor and you say, right, I'd like to come work with you if you've got any funding for me, or I've got my own funding if you've got space for me, okay? And, and so you establish this one-to-one -one correspondence and you come here on that basis. There, it's different. You're accepted uh, into the program and then, you know, once that happens, then the professors then uh, show you the projects that they've got. And then you write down a list uh, in the rank ordered list in the order of decreasing interest. So my number one pick, my number two, et cetera, et cetera. And on that basis, they then give you a project. So I went there with the intention of working in, the, in an area uh, called thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Um, and the person that I ended up working with had just arrived literally a few weeks before I arrived. So she was setting up her lab and everything like that. And, and, I, and I saw what she was working on. I thought that was really interesting. So I, I had her as my second pick, right? But I was very interested in her. And it, it turned out that I, I was the only one who had put her down, right? <laughs> And so what she was doing really resonated with me. And, and she was working on this area of, uh, of science and engineering called fluid dynamics, right? So she was very interested in how fluids flowed when you apply the force or a stress, and in particular in flows, which could be applicable to what happens in your, in your lung, inside your airways. Um, so let's imagine that, you know, you, uh, you're a neonatal, you're, you're a baby, uh, and, and, you know, you're trying to, to breathe maybe for the first time. You want to make sure that, you know, your lungs don't collapse and your airways don't collapse. And, and that could happen uh, unless you've got these chemicals that are, uh, you know, spreading inside your lung on the surfaces of very, very thin films that line the inside of your airways called surfactants. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that that spreading process was unstable uh, and that instability could compromise um, that process and therefore could potentially lead to lung collapse. And so the question was, why was this happening? So my job, my, it was my job to go and figure out exactly what was uh, the cause of this instability and how could you remedy it. Uh, and the, 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 the method of solution was modeling. So you write down equations, you solve them typically on the computer, you compare them to experimental data, and then if there's a match, great. If not, you go back to the drawing board and you add additional physics. So, so that's, that was the, the, the thing that I did for the large majority of my time over there. And that set me up here because with the, not just with the specific knowledge that I had acquired, but with the, the modeling and, and you know, theoretical skills, computational skills, I was then able to look at a, a, a spectrum of problems, um, okay, of, of which my PhD was, was one example. Uh, and then, and then I can I use that as a launching pad for for my career. Fantastic. So it it, it was it was because you kind of like found a niche area because you saw something which you became interested in. Yeah. Which nobody else saw that interest because had you picked something which ten people were all interested in, which probably was the case with your other choices. Then, then maybe you wouldn't be where you are are now. I don't know. It's, it's quite possible. Yeah, I, I guess we'll never know. But it's just uh, it's it's very interesting how your you know your fate changes, <laughs> and and then you're always left wondering. I wonder what would have happened had I done uh, this thing. Well, you know, had I worked with this other professor, had I gone down that track. Would I be here? Would I be somewhere else? Would I even be in academia? I think I probably would be in academia. Maybe not here. Maybe somewhere else. I guess we'll never know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can speculate, but we will we will never yeah. know. That's yeah. so. Then you had clearly you had a good experience, or I'm I'm assuming did you have a good experience during your PhD? Was there things which you thought were were challenging at all, or did you feel well supported, etc.? So um, I mean, I felt. I felt pretty good about the fact that the, the you know the, the classes there were multicultural, so we really had people selected from you know all over the, the world. So I think that was that was really good. Mm -hmm. We were pushed and stretched there, uh, and and people would tell you this is part of the humbling experience of being in grad school. So you guys think you're good, you know you're very good students, but 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 you know by design, you know we're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to test you. Uh, and so the, the the marks that you were allocated, I mean, they used a full spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and they would say, okay, don't be disheartened if you got this. And, and you know, let's say you ended up with 60%. You're not used to 60% or 50% or whatever. Mm -hmm. The top mark actually happened to be 60% because the questions were set. So that there were one of them was just impossible to do. So so there, there was this, this culture of don't worry about the marks. Mm -hmm. We're here just to really stretch you and you'll thank us later. Mm -hmm. And so we did thank them later. But whilst we were going through the agony, it was a bit, <laughs> it was a bit painful. And so, you know, I mean, it was, it was pretty common where the whole cohort would sit together and try to crack a single question for a homework problem. And that was quite nice because, you know, kind of brought us together collaboratively. So that was good. Um, you know, Whilst writing the thesis, obviously there are anxieties there. Can I finish in time? Can I can I do all this? Uh, I had secured my offer from college here in February of of ninety eight, uh, and I had my viva in um, July of ninety eight. So I had secured my offer before the PhD, wow. which was great. But then my then head of the department said to me, "I think it would be really great if you went back and wrapped things up." You don't want the, you know, the thesis hanging over your head. Just you know, make a clean break, right? Just go there, dedicate yourself to doing that. Uh, and so I had to balance that with the fact that my advisors felt that, you know, I was quite an experienced PhD student and naturally wanted more articles and, and things like that. So that that was a, I had, I had to balance those two, two mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And I think I managed to do a reasonable job on that front, but there was some stress uh, in getting the job done. Yeah. And I suppose you, you now you had that 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 process of having that time limit on it in terms of you know I've got another position I need to get all of these things wrapped up and and move on. So having come back to Imperial and having now had because it's it's one thing being a student in a place, 
But now when you've gone from being a student to being on faculty, right, yeah. or being a member of staff, how was that transition for you? So um, my natural instinct, right, when I arrived back here, was to call my colleagues Professor this and Dr. that, because that, that was what I used to call them, because they, you know, they were our lecturers at that point in time. Uh, and, and I think the culture's changed now where you know, people can call you by your first name. I think that's really cool. There's no problem with that. But back in the day, you know, it would be Dr. Mitchell or Professor Mitchell rather than, hi, Wayne, how are you doing? So I find myself doing that. And then my head of the, my boss at that point in time took me to one side and said, look, you, you've, you're, you're no longer an undergraduate, right? You, you are uh, a member of staff. So, so you've got to behave like a member of staff. I know it'll take time. But you've got to, you know, make a conscious effort not to call Wayne Professor Mitchell. His name is Wayne. Your name is Omar. He's going to call you Omar. Right? <laughs> That's how it is. <laughs> and come down and have coffee with us. And I mean, so there was an attempt at, at integrating me, mm -hmm. which for which I was very grateful. Right. So mm -hmm. that that was good. But there was, you know, for the first few weeks, there was this element of, oh, I, I'm I'm mixing with the people that used to teach me. You know, it's kind of weird. But that weirdness eventually dissipated. So that was fine. Uh, well, it, it's amazing because it's yours is almost like a homecoming story. Right? Yeah. Kind of like you went away, you've come back. But this is always, from what you're saying, you've always had this kind of affinity, this this desire to work within the college and to mm. do the best for it. So I suppose my question is, is how have you seen the college change over the period of time that you've been at within the institution either change for the better change for the worse. what changes have you observed yeah okay so i i guess it's difficult to divorce the the, the um the mindset and the ambition and you know the general energy of the place from technological advances that have taken place almost concurrently Mm -hmm. since my arrival here 25 years ago. I'll give you an example. When I arrived here uh, 25 years ago, there would be an administrator that would walk around with a clipboard uh, and a piece of paper. She had like a matrix and, and you know, there was the days of the week and nine to five and she was organizing a meeting. So she would say, okay, Wayne, you could do Wednesday, but not Tuesday. And Omar can do Friday, but not Monday. And then she would, you know, uh, at the end of the week, there'll be a memo in your box that would say, Hi, there's a meeting. Okay. I mean, there was email, right? But, you know, I don't think people had really kind of, uh, well, certainly there was no email at home. There were no phones with emails. I mean, obviously, yeah. right? And so your email was was there. And so you would use it. But But these practices were still ongoing. So that just gives you an idea, right? Yeah. And so now fast forward to where we are now. <laughs> Okay, so that took that, eliminated it, and put everything else on steroids. But I would say the mindset of the university has evolved from um, being um, contented with being a player in the UK, maybe in Europe, to thinking about how we can be legitimately in the top four or five institutions sustainably uh, over the next, you know, however many years in the future, right? Uh, and thinking seriously about the moves and the changes that have got to be made, right, in order for us to to transition to that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that that was there back in, and certainly as an undergraduate, I was completely oblivious to that space. You mm -hmm. know, it was bad enough trying to meet the deadlines. But when I arrived back as a, as a lecturer, I, I don't think that that was there. And, and, and that, that started to change over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say now with the launch of the new strategies, you'll see it and on the 5th of March, you'll see uh, even more evidence uh, of that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing was, I would say, everything was very much South Kensington centric, right? Yeah. Um, and in fact, when I was an undergraduate, there was no connection with the Faculty of Medicine. There was, there was just Imperial College of Science, Engineering and Technology. There was no medicine. The, the business school was really more of a management type school. That hadn't evolved either. So now we can, we can comfortably say we're science, engineering, technology, business and medicine. And how many other places in the world can make such a claim of having all of these things in one place, right? Yeah. So 
absolutely things have changed enormously <laughs> um, okay, when you put it like that i can see that transition i, I i'm, I'm going to ask because i know that i although i haven't said it before i know that you're one of the heads of department um and how has your role because I, I, i'm just really very interested in that evolution of your own progression going from an undergrad going from that little boy or the the teenager who heard about imperial college and heard about this place is doing good things you should think about going to going from there to be an undergraduate to then a lecturer and the progressions how are you then influencing this space um going forward or trying to influence this space as well so i mean firstly when i became head of department i i just had a moment to think about that evolution and thinking how uh, enormously proud I was to be sitting in, in this chair where, you know, I, I mean, in this room, I remember coming in here for tutorials, yeah. right, and dreading it. You know, Professor Wakem was going to ask me a question. I was going to fall flat on my face. I remember giving a presentation in this room for my final year research project. And a lot was riding on that, feeling the trepidation of that. So, so I mean, all, all of these things then come back and hit you hard, right? So there was a lot of that. Now, the, the, the thing that I'm trying to do um, for, for us here is to future-proof us, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I can see a lot of changes in the world, um, and those changes are, well, I mean, you know, geopolitical. Those are bound to affect us in terms of where we attract the best talent uh, from, so making sure that we're on top of that. Uh, the changes in terms of science and technology and, and the, the desire to meet global and societal challenges to, to do with sustainability and the transition, those are going to affect us and are affecting us right now. And they are affecting us in terms of the important topics that we need to tackle from a scientific and engineering standpoint. And also from a practical perspective, where is that funding going to come from? And can we make sure that we've got a very diversified portfolio so that, you know, if something slows down, there are other things that can pick up and so we'll be in good shape. Yeah. Uh, and then very, very importantly, in terms of the student experience, and here I'm not just talking about undergraduates, I'm talking about undergrads, MSCs, PhDs, mm -hmm. postdocs, and yeah. early career researchers. How do we make sure that the offering is still unique and still of high quality and very timely and topical just to make sure that whoever comes here is given a ticket to success. They come out of here and then, you know, they're going to be fine almost no matter what happens in the world. Yeah. Okay. So that it remains worthwhile coming all the way here to Imperial and investing the time and putting up with the rigors of our courses. At the end of it, there has to be something tangible that you can, you know, endow them with to make them super strong when they come out of here. Absolutely. Right. Uh, and, and that means just making sure that we are completely focused on how the world out there is changing, how industry is changing, to make sure that the students that come here are equipped when they go out there. So for me, that's really important. So it's making sure you're keeping a, sen a sense check. You're yeah. saying what's around you, what adaptations need to be made, and ensuring that your students have those critical thinking skills. Yeah, adaptations and innovations. Yeah. Right? So I, I I love things that happen here first. I love it when I can say, you know, this was made in, in Imperial. Made in Imperial first. We got here first. I think that's terrific. And frankly, you know, whether that happens in Chemeng or it happens in chemistry or it happens in physics or, or, or uh, you know, faculty of medicine or, or the business school, I don't mind, right? I mean, as long as we're doing it here, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's amazing, amazing what you're doing. And I know that you're championing so many things over in chemical engineering um, to move the agenda and move the dial um, forward, you know. I'm going to see if there's anyone who's on the call who wants to um, ask a question. Now's your opportunity. Otherwise, I've got another couple of questions which I'll, I will ask. Um so, all right, I'm going to jump to my final final two questions. You've done a lot in your time at Imperial um, in Champion. It, your journey is, your journey of belonging, kind of like, I'm not going to say it started at Imperial, but you've, you've got that sense of belonging. So I'm going to ask the, these two final questions, which are, 
kind of like the opposite ends of the same coin. Um, what advice would you have given to your younger self? Yeah. And what do you think your younger self will look at you now and say, wow? <laughs> yeah. Um, so my younger self, I mean, yes. So in, in, in one sense, you could say, you know, I've, I've moved around and, and so on. But in another sense, I would say that my career has been actually quite vanilla. I'd already made up my mind about academia. I came here, went to the States and came back and I've been here ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, you know, that master fact that I worked on, on different areas and, and various things like that. But in terms of hopping around either different disciplines or different sectors or companies or, or whatever, you know, um, the initial turbulence was there before coming here. And then after that, it's been pretty, I would say, knock on wood, pretty smooth sailing. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the I, I'm not sure what sort of advice I would give myself, um, you know, uh, in, in that sense. Um, maybe think about uh, maybe work life, work life balance a little bit more. Thinking mm -hmm. about that, maybe having a, a more balanced kind of existence, I think that would be good. Yeah, uh, th there's a lot that needs to be done, Wayne. And so sometimes, you know, I really find myself violating the rules, uh, in, and and certainly not not living by the values that I I preach. You know, you should take time off. You should do this, that, and the other. I I think that's probably the the thing that my younger self would probably tell me uh, now, right? Yeah. Uh, and what what would you say the what would be the wow factor that they'd look at you and say wow? Uh well, so you know, growing up, I I guess I always wanted to be an academic, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, I suppose um, I've managed to to achieve that, which I think uh, is good. Um, I well, I think it's great to be honest with you. You know, being in at Imperial, living in London working with the wonderful students that we've got here, interacting with colleagues that are in many ways world-class in, in what they do, certainly in terms of the their research uh, and, and some of their teaching. I think that's fantastic. I, I don't think it gets better than that. And, and I think actually just on this point, some people may say, what happens if you went to the States or what happens if you go to Europe? The grass is always greener on the other side. There is always a caveat. There's always something, right? <laughs> there is no free lunch or 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 this, uh, you know, magic money trees in places or or the lands of milk and honey. They 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 really don't exist. <laughs> this is probably, as far as I'm concerned, the closest I'm going to come to any of that, and I'm very happy about that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Omar, it's been a real pleasure to hear your story. And really, it's a big thank you for sharing it with us this afternoon. Um, I'm sure there's so much more that we could have discussed. But, you know, I think we got a really good snapshot of those things which help to motivate you, those things which have helped you to get to where you are and to help to um, build the new landscape that we're seeing here at Imperial College. And so I want to just say, continue what you're doing. And I know we'll be in, having conversations about what more we can do together. So Fantastic. Big thank you. All Thanks right. very much. Thanks, Wayne, for inviting me. Thanks, everybody who, who attended my, uh, my interview. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'm going to just share um, with everyone what's going to happen next. Um, just one second. And then... OK, so we're taking a break next week, but we will be back in two weeks and we're going to have a mystery guest. Right? We're having a mystery guest in two weeks time. So I will announce closer to the time the exact guest who it's going to be. Um, but if you have missed any of the previous episodes, then please go to our YouTube channel, which is tinyurl.com forward slash belonging dash IAO. And you'll be able to hear, I think we're at about 100. I think you were the 170th guest today. Um, so we will be, you can see all of those other videos there. Um, it, and um, once again, I just want to say a really big thank you to all of those people who have contributed to the story of belonging. 
because everybody's story is about how we belong together. Um, and we learn so much from these stories. So until next, or until the next time we meet on the um, 16th, keep doing what you're doing to find your place and to find where you feel comfortable to belong. So until next time, bye-bye.